Wonderful. <laughs> so uh, welcome to our lecture, July 2nd. And um, <clears throat> we're going to start by resuming a discussion that we began last time. Um, this is the discussion of the bead on a spinning wire loop. So <clears throat> let's take a moment to look at our uh, lecture notes from last time. Uh, in some sense, this is our chalkboard, right? Our uh, paper that we write on during lecture. <clears throat> And uh, this is an example that is studied in the book, and we will study this intensively from different perspectives because it is uh, so profitable to us to learn from this example. <clears throat> Again, the physical situation, uh, in other words, the experiment that you would set up in the laboratory is the following. We have a wire loop. So you think of taking a piece of stiff wire that is uh, fashioned into a circular loop like so, and arranging it so that this vertical line, now remember this vertical line is not perpendicular to the loop. Right? Uh, the vertical line makes contact with the loop here at the top and it makes contact with the loop here at the bottom. So it is reminiscent of a standard uh, kitchen uh, gadget, uh, which is an electric mixer. There are two of these things. In other words, those typically aren't circular loops, but the point is, you have a, an axis, you have a closed curve like so, and it's rotating about this axis. We're gonna take this axis to be vertical. That's important for us because the gravitational potential energy of the particle uh, figures into the Lagrangian. <clears throat> okay, so again, these notes are from our discussion last time. This is a case where a single generalized coordinate, and we're gonna use this angle theta. Notice theta is measured relative to the bottom position down here. Theta is zero when the particle is at the very lowest point on the loop. And we measure theta relative to that location. This is uh, reminiscent of what we do for the pendulum. Typically when you study a pendulum, you measure the angular displacement away from the lower equilibrium position. Okay, there's also an upper equilibrium. And we'll have a lot of fun talking about that but we typically measure the angular displacement relative to the lower equilibrium, and we emphasize this theta can be positive or negative, a special case is when omega, the angular velocity of this uh, wire loop, when that's zero, we do literally have a pendulum. The physical problem is identical to a pendulum. A bead, a point mass constrained to move along the circular path is absolutely identical to the standard problem of a pendulum where typically you think of a fixed point, which in this case would be the center of the circle, and you think of either a string or better would be to have a rigid rod, which allows you to explore motion here near the top. <clears throat> okay, so this was the setup last time, and <clears throat> we talked about how you analyze this problem using Lagrangian mechanics. The problem would be much more difficult if we did not have Lagrangian mechanics. We would have to think about the force that the loop exerts on the bead. That's the so-called constraint force, and it's rather complicated. As the loop is spinning about its vertical axis, and as the particle is moving, there is a force. Uh, we can say one thing, the force is perpendicular to the direction of the wire at the location where the particle is, right, because there's no friction. So the one thing we can say is the force of constraint is, per at this location, for example, the force of constraint is perpendicular to the direction that I'm indicating with my pen here. <clears throat> so that much we can say, but that's a two-dimensional vector space and some effort is required to figure out that force. One of the wonderful things about the Lagrangian formulation of classical mechanics is that we can solve this problem with ease, never having to compute that force. Later, after we solve the problem, we can compute the force uh, after the fact, so to speak, because we, at that point, we have the motion of the particle, we can compute the acceleration in a three-dimensional space, and we know that that is the vector sum of all the forces acting on the particle divided by the mass. We know gravity is one of those forces, so the remaining forces must be the constraint force. So it's a wonderful story. We're gonna revisit the story today to really fill in the details. <clears throat> so this discussion here, again, these were the notes from yesterday's uh, lecture. So now, what I've done for today, I've copied over the, di the diagram, Again, with the crucial elements, theta is our generalized coordinate. 
there it is. Theta is our generalized coordinate. In this problem, we have just one generalized coordinate. <clears throat> okay, and now let's have a close look at how to set this up. <clears throat> Remember what we did yesterday, we used as some quote unquote divine inspiration. We wrote down a formula for the kinetic energy. Okay. It is possible to prove this rigorously by uh, following up on two kind of inspired hints that we can identify one component of the velocity that's tangent. Remember the velocity is a vector. There's one component of that vector that's tangent to the hoop. I should say the loop. And there's another one that's perpendicular to the plane of the loop. Okay, the component uh, radially is zero. That is to say, capital R is a constant. The distance from the particle to the center of the device here is always capital R, so there's no radial component. So this formula for the kinetic energy in the laboratory frame, remember you must compute the kinetic energy in an inertial frame. This formula was the result of that analysis. Well, <clears throat> let's see how we can arrive at an expression for the kinetic energy using a very general pres prescription, okay? And <clears throat> this general prescription uh, is very fundamental to what we're doing. Um, it's very likely that you will need this for the midterm. I'll tell you right now, it's extraordinarily likely you will need this for the midterm. And I'll tell you the precise equation. It's equation 734. Equation 734 in our text. Let us begin singing the praises of this equation. <clears throat> so here's what we have. Again, this will be uh, a nice exercise in understanding functional relationships. That's something we have been emphasizing in this course. Um, in classical mechanics, you have a, a variety of functions of multiple variables. And simply keeping track of what is a function of what, that's really the key. So here we go. Okay, it is this equation here, which we must understand uh, in great detail. Um, again, it is in the book, equation 734 in chapter seven, of course. Okay, and I think it is appropriate that we add some alarming red color here, maybe not alarming, just really amazing. I mean red color for the same reason, you know, fire engines are red. So for extra visibility to emphasize the importance, etc. Okay, now let's talk about every aspect of this equation. <clears throat> so first of all, we have a collection of particles. Capital N is the number of particles. Number of particles. And you know, in classical mechanics, the particles are distinguishable. You can uh, give them names. For example, we've chosen to name our particles one, two, three, up, et cetera, up to capital N. That is, we've numbered them. But the point is they're distinguishable and you can give each one a unique label. Number of particles. I have to switch to my small font because now this diagram over here really is a, uh, a special case. Okay, now let's observe for this problem here. This is the bead on, uh, on the spinning wire loop. Capital N is equal to one. There's only one particle, there it is. That little particle right there, it's a point mass, it has mass M, that's our particle. Okay, so far so good. So alpha is the particle uh, index, right? So this is the identity of the particle. 
Okay, so far so good. The cap, uh, sorry, the lowercase r, lowercase r vector. This is our standard notation, very fundamental to everything we do. It is a three component vector, x, y, and z. So in particular, here you would have x sub alpha, y sub alpha, and z sub alpha. These are the Cartesian coordinates of the particle. And this equation really uh, is what in computer science is called the signature of the function. Um, <clears throat> we're simply uh, exhibiting all the arguments here. This is a statement that there must exist a formula for any given problem. There must, there must exist a formula which tells you the location of the particle, the x, y, z components, the location in a three-dimensional space as a function of the generalized coordinates. Remember, we have this notion of generalized coordinates. And we use lowercase n, right? We got a capital N here and a lowercase n here. Now I understand everyone has their own unique style of handwriting and that's wonderful. We, we, uh, we embrace the, uh, what's called individuality. Yeah, but we really need, whatever you're doing with your handwriting, we need you to have your capital N look different from your lowercase n. I know some people kind of push the limits with their, some people write their cues backwards, et cetera. Wait a minute, that's not gonna work because that'll be a lowercase p. But yeah, people do weird things with their handwriting, but we do need your capital N to be different from your lowercase n. All right, so the number of generalized coordinates is little n. Okay, so n equals the number And our generalized coordinates are Q1 through Qn. So the, the, these are very important principles to us. Uh, again, let's have a quick look at the problem. We're interested in the bead on the spinning wire loop. Okay, so it turns out for this problem, Capital N is one, we have one particle. Capital N is the number of particles. And for this problem, the number of generalized coordinates is one. Okay, so it happens that they're both equal. Now let's think back. Ha uh, have we seen an example recently where these two numbers were different? And the answer is yes. Recently, we looked at the problem where you have a single particle moving in a three-dimensional space. So capital N would be one, you have a single particle, little n, Three, right? You have three generalized coordinates. If there's a particle moving in a three-dimensional space, an unconstrained particle, it's not forced to move on a surface or a wire or anything, then you have three coordinates. You could use the three Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z. You could use spherical coordinates, r, theta, phi. Okay, so it's useful as we go through this to have this example at hand. All right, so what is this equation? It's very fundamental. Uh, since you are in the driver's seat, you get to choose your generalized coordinates. We just uh, ask that you do a few sanity checks here, and this is one of them. You must be able to write down a formula for each of the particles in the problem. You have to have a formula that specifies the location of the particle in a three-dimensional space if the generalized coordinates are known and if the time t is known. For this problem, it's nice because we do have a time dependence, okay? There will be many other problems. For example, uh, what we just mentioned a moment ago, if you have a single particle moving in a three-dimensional space, and if there are no constraint forces, then you will have three generalized coordinates. And if you use spherical coordinates, for example, then there's no time dependence. You can write down explicit formulas, and we have done this for x, y, and z of the particle as a function of r, theta, and phi. And there's no time dependence. So that's an example where there's no time dependence. Here, this is an example where there is time dependence. So let's, as our first order of business, let's write out, in the language of computer science, especially if you do object-oriented programming, we're going to instantiate. We're gonna instantiate this equation. That means we're going to create an instance of this equation. Here we go. We're gonna create an instance of this equation. And at the same time, 
uh, it's, it can be very enjoyable, right? We're um, taking this opportunity to appreciate that this is a very general principle, the idea that you must be able to write down these formulas, and let's see how it works in this particular instance. Okay, there it is. I think we should use the same color. Let's get the red color here. Okay, now let's begin with the remark here. Uh, remember, capital N is one. There's only one particle. This alpha, remember alpha is the particle index. It ranges from one up to N. Well, we only have one particle. So alpha ranges from one up to n, so it really carries no information. We can record down here alpha equals one, but what we have done is we have streamlined uh, the notation. Okay, now I see there's a, uh, there's a message in the chat window. Let me have a look at the chat window here. Um, okay, great question. Yes, uh, let's, let's take a moment to remind ourselves lowercase n is one. This is an excellent question. Let's talk about this. Um, lowercase n is one, okay? And the reason is, uh, the answer, let me indicate the answer like this. I'll bring in a different color. Here's a pencil. Um, we have a wire loop, okay? Uh, what I've done using the pencil here, I've emphasized, <coughs> I've emphasized some text using the pencil. The loop is a one-dimensional curve. Okay, great question and see how it gives us a nice opportunity to add some details here. Uh, what we're saying here, I should continue with pencil because this remark, uh, I've, I've used the pencil to indicate it is um, a remark that we're adding now uh, in response to this question. So the loop, the loop is a one dimensional curve. In the language of mathematics, it's a manifold. It's a one dimensional manifold. Loop is a one dimensional I'm in trouble, I ran out of space. Okay, I have to turn the paper, sorry. Yeah, that's legible, it's definitely legible. The loop is a one-dimensional curve. Okay, and so let's talk about this. Um, <clears throat> we have also talked about problems where you have a different constraint, and this is on homework three. As you know, homework three has been published, and we do have a problem where, you remember we had a lot of fun with this lowercase h of x comma y. On the previous homework assignment, we talked about lowercase h of x comma y, and this function, h was for height, right? You have a surface above the xy plane. Let's think of the xy plane as being horizontal. You have some arbitrary surface above the xy plane. It can be a rolling landscape such as we have in the Berkeley Hills, for example. <clears throat> h of x comma y was a function that defined a surface. And in the previous assignment, we were interested in topics that were central to chapter six, things like finding the shortest distance. So we had uh, some interesting calculations, setting up the technology to find the shortest distance between two points on the surface, right? Obviously a wonderful example of the calculus of variation. Um, now, the calculus of variations. Now we're in chapter seven. The current homework assignment, we revisit the mathematical framework, okay? but understand it's a much different problem. We have the same landscape. Again, think of the rolling hills near Berkeley, okay? You have some sort of landscape. Now let's imagine this is a frictionless surface. And let's talk about the dynamics, the motion of a particle. 
On the previous homework assignment, we were not talking about the motion of a particle. We were simply talking about the shortest path. Suppose you'd like to know the shortest path between two points. And of course, in general, it's not unique. There could be several different solutions. Anyways, uh, on the current homework assignment, we'll talk about the motion of a particle. Suppose you uh, somehow <clears throat> have a chunk of ice, okay? And uh, this could be accomplished by taking a big cube of ice and taking a, a blowtorch and melting a lot of it so that you have a very interesting shape frictionless surface. And now let's have a point particle move around on that surface. That's what we're going to compute in the present homework assignment. That's a case where little n would be two. You have a particle constrained to a two-dimensional surface. And in terms of actual physics, of course, there would be cases where the particle gathered enough speed to lift off. And those of you that enjoy riding dirt bikes, you do this all the time, right? Get up some speed, go over a lump, and now you're in the air. And we do that on the water at the Berkeley Marina, right? We have a lot of windsurfing equipment, we jump into the air. So <laughs> we can, uh, We've talked about this before. Imagine taking two plexiglass surfaces that with a small gap and having a particle constrained between them. So it is possible to set up experiments where a particle is constrained to a two-dimensional surface. Um, okay, so that's on the, and so yeah, great question. Uh, we can imagine question, uh, lots of problems where lowercase n would be two. But for this problem, lowercase n is one because we have a loop. A loop is a one-dimensional curve and uh, we could repeat this with an elliptical loop or a super ellipse, uh, you know, et cetera and so forth. We can have a parabolic loop. All of these are one dimensional curves. Sorry, we could not have a parabolic loop. We could have a parabolic, we could have a piece of wire bent into a parabolic shape. The point is it's a one dimensional curve. All of these examples would have little n equals one, meaning a single coordinate. And again, you can imagine getting a sharp engraving tool and etching some numbers into the wire. That's what we do here. You can actually label these locations on the wire using values of theta. We've chosen theta, but you could use a different generalized coordinate. And yeah, so that's a great question. And again, little n is equal to one because there is only one generalized coordinate. A single number is all that is necessary to specify the location on the loop. If you had a surface of constraint, you would need two parameters. You could you, you use your creativity and imagination to dream up some cool coordinates. Of course, you're welcome to use uh, any of the standard coordinate systems. All right, yep, so there's the little n equals one. And um, yep, so and because we have a single particle, if capital N is one, then you can dispense with this alpha index. There's no need to distinguish the particles. The alpha index enables you to distinguish the particles but if capital N is one, then we could drop that. For emphasis, we could put a subscript one on these coordinates, x1, y1, z1, but we always strive to streamline the notation. So let's just drop the subscript. So yeah, this here is an instance of our formula. And again, uh, this theta is q1. Right. <clears throat> the notation in general, for generalized coordinates, the, the most general notation we use is lowercase q1 through lowercase qn. However, for any given problem, we often like to use more descriptive variables. So we could have called this angle q1, but it's nice to use theta. That's uh, just more natural notation, right? So typically, when you, when you choose generalized coordinates, you typically choose some variable that is descriptive and helps you uh, to remember its role, right? Communication is the key here. We want to communicate our ideas as clearly as possible. So here we've chosen this theta. Theta tells us it's an angle. It's a nice reminder. It's an angle. Okay. So yeah, this is the important thing. Uh, okay, we got another question in the chat window. So let me uh, see. So the n value doesn't necessarily correspond to the number of dimensions of the position function. Right, that's right. So yeah, this is important. The problem is in a three-dimensional space. So let's, let's record that here. Here, the laboratory is very much a three-dimensional space. 
right? So the number of dimensions is three. This, this truly is a three-dimensional problem. The physics, we fundamentally have a three-dimensional problem. Later, we can identify forces, centrifugal force, et cetera, forces of constraints. These forces are in a three-dimensional vector space. So it truly is a three-dimensional problem, but the fact that you only need a single coordinate to specify the location, and what's clear here from these formulas, the value of the coordinate theta together, you must have the value of the time t because the position of the wire loop itself is time dependent. So you must have knowledge of the time t that tells you the orientation of the loop, right? It's spinning about a vertical axis. So knowledge of t tells us the orientation of the loop and then knowledge of theta fully specifies the location of the particle. So yeah, great question uh, in the chat window there. Again, that was a private question, so it's not visible to other students. But yeah, we're emphasizing it is a three-dimensional space, but lowercase n is the number of generalized coordinates. It's the number of variables that you need to specify to fully determine the configuration. Okay, the velocity is a separate subject, right? We will, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go there by getting derivatives involved. But the crucial thing here is the so-called classic, classical configuration the classical configuration is logically distinct from the classical state. The classical state involves both the configuration and the velocities. But here, we're interested in specifying the classical configuration, and that is we need knowledge of the positions of all the particles. <clears throat> yep, so this is a wonderful example to, uh, to illustrate um, how this framework works. Okay, so having said that, let's get right to work and <clears throat> compute the kinetic energy. So this is a general prescription for computing the kinetic energy. I have this frictionless pen, that's why it slipped out of my hand. It's a special frictionless pen. You gotta really hold on to it. Um, okay, so here we go. We want the kinetic energy. The crucial thing is that theta is our generalized coordinate and we do have explicit time dependence here. X and Y have explicit, there's no explicit time dependence for Z, but we do have explicit time dependence for X and Y. Okay, let's get right to work. X dot, the derivative of X. Well, X, we do have a product of two functions and theta now in this context is time dependent. Okay, so when we compute X dot, Remember, that's a, a notation for DDT, and that's a regular DDT. It's not a partial derivative, it's a DDT, meaning we want the total time derivative. This is uh, now in the mathematical setting where theta is a function of time. Okay, so uh, first term, we're differentiating this sine theta, cosine theta. For clarity, I'll put parentheses like so, theta dot right? Just to make it clear, it's cosine theta, that quantity times theta dot, and then we got the cosine omega t. We're going for maximum clarity here. That's the first term. We've differentiated this first factor. The product rule tells us copy over the first factor and differentiate the second one. We do get a minus sign here. So minus r omega from the chain rule, we're getting that omega, and now it's a sine theta and it's going to be a sine. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, so this illustrates uh, how we compute this derivative. And again, the mathematical setting is very important. To compute this x dot, now this is the total time derivative, we must take into account that theta in this context now is thought of as a function of time. When you write the Lagrangian, theta is not thought of as a function of time. And when you differentiate the Lagrangian, theta is not thought of as a function of time. It's thought of as an independent variable. But in this context here, when we compute the kinetic energy, we must proceed very systematically. And you see, you can do this in the general context. You start computing derivatives. So here, we use the chain rule. We differentiate the sine theta. That gave us the cosine theta times theta dot. And we differentiated this factor cosine omega t, that gives us a minus sine omega t, and then by the chain rule, we got this multiplicative factor of omega. So similar 
calculation here, similar. Uh, we have to budget our time in lecture. Okay, Z dot. Let's go through the calculation for Z dot just to emphasize there's no explicit time dependence here, right? Z is just a function of theta. Okay, we're going to differentiate the cosine. Wonderful, there's a minus sign. It just keeps getting better here. So we got the R, we got the uh, sine theta. Again, I'll put parentheses just for clarity to indicate it's a sine of theta, not the sine of theta times theta dot. Uh, yep, and there's our theta dot. Okay, so there you have it. Then we compute the kinetic energy. Okay, and you can see some wonderful things happen. Uh, we've got lots of sines and cosines. <clears throat> there are abundant occurrences of sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. It really works out nicely. We do have a minus sign here. You'll see in this formula, there's a positive sign. So uh, certain cancellations occur with the cross terms. And um, then when the smoke clears, we do get the same answer as, you remember last time we talked about the kinetic energy. You got this nice formula here where rho is shorthand for r sine theta. You get the same answer. Okay, wonderful. Um, <clears throat> so that was just an opportunity to review, um, right, to review what we did last time. <clears throat> okay, so now let's take stock of this, uh, the, the setup, right? Once you have the kinetic energy, of course, you can set up the Lagrangian very quickly. And then we have a prescription. Okay, so let's let's talk about the big picture here. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about the milestones. Right? In chapter seven, we've done a number of extraordinary things. So uh, here are some milestones. Okay. So amongst the amazing things we've done in chapter seven, first, <clears throat> um, we looked at the case where you have one unconstrained particle. So n equals one in our language uh, that we just introduced, capital N is the number of particles. We considered one particle. We considered unconstrained. and it was 3D, and uh, we looked at a conservative force, okay? That means you can introduce a potential, the force vector is minus the gradient of the potential, <clears throat> okay? In this case, we worked out the Lagrangian, right? So we, uh, and we used x, y, and z as coordinates here. So the Lagrangian was our one half m and we were very general here uh, allowing this to be an arbitrary function of x, y, and z. Uh, we had a separate discussion for time dependent potentials but for the moment this was our Lagrangian and what we showed is that um, Newton's second law Newton's second law force equals mass times acceleration this was equivalent to the Euler-Lagrange equations Okay, so remember that was the first thing we did. Um, we used good old Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z, and it was useful just to go through the motions and see how this worked. Remember the Euler-Lagrange equations are a little bit mysterious, right? You compute some partial derivatives of the Lagrangian, then you must also compute a total time derivative. You write down all that stuff. 
And it was very rewarding to see that we got exactly the same thing here. Uh, force equals mass times acceleration and the force is minus the gradient of the potential. Okay, the same thing now, let's see, item number two. Our second major milestone, <clears throat> at same setup, So capital N was equal to one. We had an unconstrained particle in 3D, et cetera. However, now we use three generalized coordinates. Okay. So <clears throat> you could call them Q1, Q2, and Q3. Uh, if you choose spherical coordinates, they would be R, theta, and phi, et cetera. You could use cylindrical. And so here we had the general setup and the Lagrangian now, properly speaking, you should use a different name for it because it's a different function. L sub Q, uh, Q1, Q2, Q3, and we had a Q1 dot. All right. Sometimes people dispense with this subscript. It really is necessary to give the function a different name because it's a different function. Uh, for example, suppose you were using spherical coordinates and um, then the question would be, what is the Lagrangian of some number, say you have 1.2 meters, right? That's a distance, comma zero, comma zero, comma zero, comma zero, comma zero. Well, you don't know which you don't know which function to use, right? This could be x equals 1.2 meters, y equals zero, z equals zero, and all, you know, the velocity vector zero. Or you could have spherical coordinates. It's the radius equal 1.2 meters, the two angles equaling zero. See, so uh, this emphasizes that you must actually, strictly speaking, use a different name for the function to emphasize uh, which one of these two functions to use. In practice, we're often, writing symbols and uh, it's, Q, it's clear if there are a bunch of Qs here, then we're using the Q Lagrangian. <clears throat> but sometimes people are sloppy about this uh, notation. And if it's really clear from the context, then you can drop the Q. Okay, now the third thing we did, All right. Now in lecture, we didn't have time to talk about this, but you can have multiple particles. So in our notation, the statement that we're considering multiple particles can be expressed very compactly by saying capital N is greater than one. Uh, for example, two particles, okay? In chapter eight, we're going to have uh, some very interesting discussions about the case where you have two particles and there's a so-called central force. And we will compute elliptical orbits, hyperbolic trajectories, et cetera, and so forth. So let's talk about the case where capital N is two. <clears throat> then the Lagrangian looks like this. Okay, it's a function of 12 variables, right? Here, you have three variables, and you would say, in our notation, this is alpha equals one. The so-called particle index. This one, alpha equals two, right? The Lagrangian, <clears throat> function of 12 variables. So the kinetic energy of the first particle, one half m1, the mass of the particle is m1, r1 dot, that's the velocity vector. And when we square a vector, that means we dot it into itself. Okay, so there's the kinetic energy of the system. And um, now we have a potential energy that's a function of six variables. 
Okay. So this is the basic framework. If you have two particles, um, and here we're using the rectangular coordinates or the Cartesian coordinates, the structure of the kinetic energy is like so. It's a nice quadratic polynomial in the velocity components. And then in general, we have a, a function of R1 comma R2, okay? In general, this is not the sum of two functions. So for example, uh, could be, this could be a function of the interparticle distance. And so for a gravitational problem, right? You would have precisely this form. We will be very interested in problems where the potential energy of the two particle system is just a function of the interparticle distance, right? So this construction here, first we have a vector subtraction that gives you a relative displacement vector. And then the two vertical lines indicate we want the length of that relative displacement vector. This is the interparticle distance, the separation between the particles. So it's often the case that the potential energy is just a function of the distance between the two particles. Certainly true for uh, Newtonian gravity. Perhaps you're looking at electrical forces. Another nice example, uh, assuming a quasi-static approximation, right, et cetera. So yeah, we will be very interested in chapter eight in this kind of a problem. <clears throat> okay, so, but quite generally, if you have a potential energy that's a function of these two positions and their position vectors, then the force on particle number one is minus the gradient, and we, we must put an index on the gradient here. This is a particle label, all right? It's not the first component of the gradient, which would be ddx. This is the particle, and again, alpha equals one. Acting on u and f2. Here we must differentiate the function with respect to x2, y2, and z2. All right, so that's the setup for um, <coughs> Uh, these kind of problems with multiple particles. Um, and again, this is a special case. So that, let's emphasize when I say could, that's a special case. It doesn't have to be. Um, for example, you could have a very ha heavy, massive star at the origin. Let's, let's just assume it doesn't move because it's so much more massive than these two smaller objects that are going to orbit in the presence of that gravitational field. So in that case, you would have a capital U which uh, involves contributions uh, that come from the distance from the two particles to the origin. And then furthermore, you could allow for a gravitational interaction between the two particles, right? And we'll do that later in the course. We'll look at a spacecraft uh, flying by Venus, right? There's a gravitational interaction between the, this will be the Cassini spacecraft uh, going very close to Venus and getting deflected by uh, the planet's gravitational field. And all the while, both the spacecraft and the planet are under the influence of the sun's gravitational field. So that's an example. All right, that's the framework. Here. And so for our next milestone, here's our fourth milestone. Okay, constrained system. This is kind of like the crown jewel. Constrained systems. N particles, did I say that right? Okay. All right, so an example would be, suppose you have uh, something like this. Here's our three-dimensional space. And again, this is something that's on the current homework summit. Let's suppose you have, again, a block of ice and then you've uh, melted away part of it uh, you as a sculptor now, unleashing your inner artist, uh, let's create some sculpture out of ice. Isn't that an official uh, hobby or something, ice sculpture? Okay, so here's this ice sculpture. <clears throat> 
And we've been, we're not as crazy as some of the artists that are out there. We've been pretty reasonable here with our ice sculpture. We've uh, created this surface. It's extraordinarily smooth because melted ice is pretty slippery. Um, now suppose you have a couple particles and they're moving around on this surface, okay? So you can imagine a multi-particle system, several particles, there it goes again, that frictionless pen. Yeah, trying to, all I'm trying to do is draw some particles here on the surface. So here we go. Here are some particles, they're moving on this surface. In this case, it's a two-dimensional surface. Okay, and we've got four particles. So um, in this example, We have four particles, so capital N is four. How many generalized coordinates do we have? Ocho. All right, because uh, it's a surface of constraint. We're in a three-dimensional space, right? The dimensionality of the space is three, three-dimensional physical space. So each one of these particles has three spatial coordinates, but because it resides on a two-dimensional surface, um, only two generalized coordinates are necessary to specify the location of particle. So this is a nice example. And so you see quite generally, we can say the number, remember little n, the number of generalized coordinates is less than or equal to uh, three n. This is in general, okay. If you have constraints, then we can say with certainty that the number of degrees of freedom is strictly less. Okay. okay, so this arrow makes it clear. For item number four, if you have a constrained system with n particles, we can say with certainty that the number of degrees of freedom is less than three n. Uh, the number of degrees of freedom is equal to 3n if there's no constraints. So let's put that here. Okay, so it's true quite generally that the number of degrees of freedom, little n, is less than or equal to 3 times capital N. And the two cases are if there are no constraints, little n is 3n capital N. If there are constraints, then little n is less than three times capital N. How much less is it? Well, it depends. Do you have a constraint surface? Do you have um, a bead sliding on a wire? Or do you have some sort of mechanism, some sort of hardware, let's say it's massless hardware, um, connecting these particles, <clears throat> etc. Okay, so that's kind of an overview here. Let's do a quick time check and um, Okay, so now we're gonna move, we're getting closer to the end of chapter seven. In our last meeting, we talked about this famous mathematician, Emmy Noter, and she proved some amazing results. This was in, in the last century, right? The, the 20th century. Um, she was one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century. So let's um, begin by looking at some applications of these ideas to our problems in mechanics. All right, so we're gonna talk about conservation laws. We know that these are very powerful principles uh, to help you solve problems, right? Think about what we did at the beginning of the semester. Um, we were able to make tremendous progress uh, solving for the motion of the pendulum, for example, by noticing that the total mechanical energy was conserved. This was a so-called so first integral of the motion. It reduces the order of the differential equation and um, the result was a first order differential equation where we could um, <clears throat> uh, construct a solution via integration. We could get the time as a function of position as an integral, and that's a major achievement. So here we go with conservation laws and Noether's theorem.
Okay. And this is named after Emmy Noter. Okay, so here's our first um, example of, of the mathematical framework. The structure is as follows. We're going to analyze a system, and we'll use Lagrangian mechanics to do this. We're gonna analyze a system that possesses a certain symmetry. So let's consider a capital N as a number of particles. Okay. And let's consider the case where there are no constraint forces. This is our first example. Um, and again, we have a conservative force as we identified up there. And we can allow this to be a time dependent. So I will summarize those words by writing, we have a capital U as a function of R1 comma, R2 dot 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 right capital N is the number of particles and we can allow for this to have a time dependence okay so <clears throat> the remarks we made earlier about a, you could have a collection of self gravitating particles perhaps you're doing astrophysics that, that would be a nice example um, but um, this is, this is a very general framework to allow problems like that. So we'd have a capital N is a number particle. We have a collection of these vectors. And then this potential also um, has, in general, time dependence. Now, suppose there is a translation invariance. Let's talk about what that means. Okay, translation invariance. <clears throat> um, this term in physics, uh, translation is a displacement of the entire system. So imagine this collection of particles. If you take all of those particles and move them a certain distance to the right, for example, that's called a translation of the system. And we're gonna set, assume that this energy is independent. Uh, it's unchanged by such a translation. So how would you write that? As an equation, uh, we define a vector epsilon okay so epsilon is a displacement vector and we're going to say that the value of capital U is unchanged if you move all of these particles uh, according to this displacement vector. So how would you write that as an equation? Okay, we take particle number one. We apply the translation. So that's the R1 vector plus the epsilon vector. That's the new location. We take particle number two. We apply the translation etc. We go all the way down the line here and there's particle n. And this is at time t. Later we'll talk about trans translations in the time direction, right? Uh, this, this, this principle is going to give us conservation of momentum and then we'll talk about time translations. They give us conservation of energy. Okay, but Here's capital U, and what this means, you know, the, the function produces a single number, and it's measured in joules, right? It's, it's a scalar value, the energy of this configuration, and this is equal to the uh, value of capital U with the particles in the original position. So that's capital U of R1, R2, dot, 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 Rn, comma t. Okay, so if we have a translation invariance, um, and again, this is the way mathematically you would say that for any epsilon, okay, the, the precise logical statement is 
for any vector epsilon, that's a three component vector, right? It's just a, a collection of three numbers, three, display, three, th three numbers that have dimensions of distance, positive or negative or zero. And um, the value of capital U with this collection of inputs must equal the value of capital U uh, with this collection of inputs. Okay, let's see how we can capitalize on this statement. We're gonna differentiate with respect to epsilon x. All right, so again, the epsilon vector is a collection of three variables, epsilon x comma epsilon y comma epsilon z. This equation is true for all epsilon vectors, and so we can differentiate with respect to epsilon x, okay? And let's see what happens. Well, the good news is there are no occurrences of epsilon x on the right-hand side. So when we differentiate the right-hand side with respect to epsilon x, we get a zero. That's good. So we're done differentiating the right-hand side zero. Here, there are lots of occurrences, right? This function uh, has 3n plus 1 inputs, right? Let's put that here. 3n plus 1 input numbers. Okay, we're going to differentiate with respect to epsilon x. There's, occurrence, there's an occurrence of epsilon x at the first, fourth, seventh, et cetera, right? The first input is here. It's the x component of this vector. The fourth is the x component of this vector. The seventh is the x component for R3, et cetera. So we have lots of occurrences of epsilon x. And so what we get here is the partial derivative of u with respect to x1, right? We must discuss this, why is it x1? Plus the partial derivative of u with respect to x2, plus dot, 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 all the way up to, there's the capital N, this is zero. Remember we observed there's no occurrence of epsilon x here on the right-hand side, so we get a zero there. Now, why is this partial u, partial x1, if we're differentiating with respect to epsilon x? And again, this is, this is a fundamental notational issue that we discussed when we were setting up the framework of Lagrangian mechanics. The point is, this function capital U has an existence regardless of what you choose to insert for the inputs. So you could insert numbers like so, here I'm pointing with the pen, or you could insert a more elaborate collection of numbers, and that's what we've done here. But the function has an existence. It's a function of 3n plus 1 input numbers, okay? And um, the same statements are true about the partial derivatives. It's a function of a lot, right? It's quite a large number. It's a multi, certainly a multivariable function, right? Lots of inputs here. Um, we have notation for the partial derivatives. In the mathematics, you would call we, the, the mathematicians use a capital D, capital D sub one for the partial derivative with respect to the first input. It's nice notation because you don't have to invoke the name of that input. In physics, we use the name, so I'll point like so with the pen. The partial derivative of that function with respect to its first input is called partial u, partial x1. And that partial derivative is again a function of these three n plus one numbers. That's true quite generally when you compute the partial derivative of a function, it's again a multivariable function. The name of that new function is partial u partial x1. Even though we insert a funny collection of objects like so, the name of the partial derivative is still partial u partial x1. That's the name of that function. Okay, so we compute the partial derivative and then after computing the derivative, we insert epsilon is zero. Okay, so we get this nice collection of partial derivatives. All right. Now, um, okay, we have a question in the chat window. So how is X related to epsilon? <clears throat> uh, the relationship is that um, X1 is the first of many variables and epsilon X occurred in that input. 
So the chain rule tells us if we differentiate with respect to epsilon x, we must look for occurrences of epsilon x, and there's one here at the first input, at the fourth input, at the seventh input. And the chain rule says you must first compute the partial derivative of the function with respect to that input, and then multiply by the derivative. And in this case, that multiplicative factor is one because here you have x1. Uh, let's let's emphasize that here. First input. Okay, the first input of the function, uh, we have x1 plus epsilon x. That occurs right about here. The second input uh, would be y1 plus epsilon y. The third input would be z1 plus epsilon z. Those are the first, second, and third inputs. And yep, our notation for partial derivatives means we write the partial derivative like so. And then we multiply by the derivative of this object with respect to epsilon x. Well, that's simply one because this is epsilon x raised to the first power. Okay, so then the, um, the Euler-Lagrange equations tell us the following. We're gonna go to another piece of paper. All right, so let's continue like so. All right. Um, we know quite generally that we have the Euler-Lagrange equations. And so this statement here, let's just write the same thing <coughs> um, using summation conventions. Here we have explicitly written out the terms, but this equation can be written using a, a nice notation. This is the sum alpha equals one to capital N partial U partial X alpha equals zero. Okay, so again, um, sometimes we like to write it like so. And here we've used the summation convention. We've introduced an index, but these two statements are identical. There's no notion of proving one or the other. It's, it's the identical statement just written uh, using different notation. Okay, so you write this term for alpha equals one, that's that. Then you write the term for alpha equals two, that's that, et cetera, all the way up to capital N giving you that one. <clears throat> okay, so if that's true, notice um, this is precisely the same as saying that the sum alpha equals one to N of the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to X alpha equals zero, okay? These are equivalent because we know the Lagrangian is kinetic minus potential. So if you like, you could multiply this equation by minus one, it's still zero, okay? And so when you compute these derivatives of the Lagrangian and add them up, the vanishing of this sum means that this will be zero, okay? Well, if that's true, then we have the following statement. We have the Euler-Lagrange equation now telling us This is a DDT, right? The total time derivative of the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to the X dot alpha. And see, I really emphasize that dot. What we have done is for each one of these terms, the partial derivative, these are the Euler-Lagrange equations, the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the coordinate X alpha is the total time derivative of the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the x dot alpha. Okay, so now, um, because differentiation is a linear operation, uh, this is equal to, so this, this equals zero, and this is equal to the total time derivative of the sum. If you have a sum of time derivative, that's the time derivative of the sum, okay? And what is the sum? Well, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to this velocity is precisely the momentum. So this is P alpha X, okay? And so what is this? Well, we're adding up the X component of all the momentum. Every particle has its own momentum vector. Particle number alpha has 
a momentum vector that's p alpha x, p alpha y, and p alpha z. Okay, so we'll use capital P, right? So this is equal to ddt, capital P is the total momentum, and here this is the x component. All right, so we've proven that the x component of the total momentum is time independent. The same calculation can be done for y and z, and so we arrive at this remarkable result. Okay, so we have the conservation of momentum. Remember we're using capital P. Let's see if I can do this. I think I'll scoot it like so. Uh, just organizing the paper so we can see this clearly. Yeah, so Noether's theorem, right? We're talking about this theorem due to N mean Noether. Uh, it has a general structure that is symmetry. If you have a system that has some symmetry, in this case, the translation invariance of the system of N particles tells us that the, the total momentum, capital P is the total momentum, and this is constant in the sense that it is independent of the time. So DDT, the time derivative of the total momentum is a constant. That's a nice example of Noether's theorem. Okay, and again, you can go through this uh, <clears throat> and get the constancy of angular momentum. You can analyze capital U. Again, this uh, capital U telling you the potential energy of a configuration of particles, and then you can investigate the implications of the statement that this uh, capital U is unchanged if you rotate the system. If you choose some axis of rotation and rotate the system, meaning perhaps you're doing astrophysics, you have a large cloud of particles. If you rotate the entire system about some axis, and uh, if the energy is unchanged, and if that's true for all possible rotations, you can prove uh, that you have conservation of angular momentum. All right. So Again, Noether's theorem, a, a wonderful result. And um, these results were actually known earlier. Right? This was known uh, earlier in history, like uh, more than 100 years earlier. But this is an example of Noether's theorem uh, as it occurs in our course. And then um, in the last century, Emmy Noether extended that to all kinds of more general symmetries. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about another exciting topic from the end of chapter uh, seven. Okay, now remember, some topics are excluded from the exam, and this topic will be one of the things that is excluded from the exam, but it's useful for us to go through it, because in doing so, we cement our understanding. We get a better understanding of what's going on. So let's talk about a Lagrangian. A Lagrangian for a charged particle in a magnetic field. So if you have a charged particle, okay, and um, we're actually going to allow for an electric and a magnetic field. One little uh, hazard here with the notation, we love to use lowercase q for the charge of a particle. Okay. So this is the charge of a particle. This will be a constant, right? It's the charge, right? Because there's a danger of confusion. In uh, classical mechanics, we like to use lowercase q for generalized coordinates. So for this discussion, we'll use the lowercase q for the charge, which is a constant, it's not a coordinate. And we'll use good old x, y, and z as the coordinates. So Lagrangian for a charged particle in Electric and magnetic field, I'll just put E. There's a vector field E and there's a vector field B. Okay, so the reason we want to go through this is we're going to talk about so called velocity dependent potentials. So, this is in contrast to what we did. The, the fundamental framework for our chapter seven is that you have a conservative force, the force is minus the gradient of a potential. This is the usual notion of a conservative force. But the reason we're going through this is that as you go through your careers, you'll see people, uh, people typically when they publish papers, 
uh, especially if you go into theoretical physics, they'll take some Lagrangian and then they'll start adding terms to it. Okay, uh, that's the nature of the game. And the logic is now slightly different. What they do is they take a Lagrangian and they say, well, let's consider adding this term and see what we get. Um, so if you take a Lagrangian and you get creative, you add some sort of term to the Lagrangian, and then you employ our standard prescription, right? we have a very standard prescription for how to extract equations of motion from a Lagrangian. There's a prescription where you compute, it's the Euler-Lagrange equations, you compute some partial derivatives, and then you compute total time derivatives, right? total time derivatives. Okay, so <clears throat> the reason we're going through this is to appreciate there's a whole world uh, of research where they start creatively adding terms to Lagrangian, and then they see what kind of equations of motion would, have, would emerge uh, if you apply the Euler-Lagrange equations. So here, we know the correct equation of motion. It's motion under the influence of the so-called Lorentz force law. So the equation of motion EOM, that's equation of motion. It's a differential equation, right? An equation of motion, it should not be uh, confused with the solution, right? The equation of motion, this term in, in classic mechanics means a differential equation which you must solve to find the motion of the particle or the evolution of the system. So the equation of motion for this problem Mass times acceleration equals the total force. Okay, so we know the equation of motion. This is the correct equation of motion. We're using MKS units, so it's the electric field plus V cross V. This V is R dot. So um, we know the answer. The question is, can we find a Lagrangian? Notice we got this magnetic field here. We could certainly do this for the electric field. If the electric field is minus, if you have electrostatics, right? Electric, electrostatics, that's a solved problem. We already know how to do that because then you have a conservative force field. But quite generally, we can do this in the context of electrodynamics where the curl of the electric field is non-zero, all right? So here, here's the situation. EOM, equation of motion. This differential equation governs the motion of the particle. Right? We're talking about solving for the motion of the particle in a prescribed electromagnetic field. Somehow we know the value of the electric field. We're not computing the radiation produced by the particle. That's a whole different problem. We have a prescribed electromagnetic field, and we would like to um, see if we can come up with a Lagrangian formulation, okay? You know from, if you've taken the 110 sequence, remember it's okay if you have not taken it because this portion of the chapter is not gonna be on the exams. Quite generally, the electric field is minus the gradient of a scalar field V, and then we also have a vector potential. There's a time derivative So if you have not had the 110 sequence, that's okay. It is not a requirement for this course. Just sit back and enjoy the wonderful world of classical electrodynamics. Now this one is required. The magnetic field is the curl of a vector potential. That certainly is covered in the first year physics courses. But uh, the more general, properly speaking, you would want to have the 110 sequence to really appreciate this. <clears throat> okay. So the remarkable thing is, the answer is yes, we can uh, write down a Lagrangian, which gives us this differential equation, if you apply the Euler-Lagrange equation. The remarkable thing is that the Lagrangian invokes reference to V and A. Now you know the vector potential is not unique, and the same, the same is true for the scalar potential. It's not as dramatic, there's an additive constant. You can add a constant to V, uh, but this is not so dramatic. The vector potential, you know, there's a huge class of transformations you can do to the vector potential and still have the same fields. So the important thing here, the physics, the electric and magnetic fields, those are physically meaningful, right? You can measure E and B, 
in the laboratory. You can measure, the, these are physically meaningful fields. Um, v and A, those are not physically meaningful. Especially A is rather complicated. There's huge freedom to redefine the vector potential A. Okay, so the remarkable thing is we can write down this Lagrangian and let's appreciate what a wonderful Lagrangian this is. The Lagrangian This is a function of seven variables. Count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, again, we're using x, y, and z as our generalized coordinates, so there are three variables. Here, x dot, y dot, z dot. That's three more, and then we got time. We have explicit time dependence because um, these potentials, v as a function of r and t, and a as a function of r, these are functions on the four-dimensional space-time. And in our notation, we have the R vector embodying X, Y, and Z, and then there's the time dependence. Notice we do allow, you see this partial derivative. It's certainly a partial derivative because the vector potential is a function of four variables. So the Lagrangian, remarkably, and we will revisit this later in the course when we do Hamiltonian mechanics. It's Hamiltonian is different. Let's focus on the Lagrangian here. There's the usual expected kinetic energy. Okay, now it's a wonderful story uh, that, that, that emerges here. But first let's appreciate the structure of this Lagrangian. Again, we must write down a function that's a function of x, y, and z, x dot, y dot, z dot, and in general, we now have this time dependence. So here, the kinetic energy, no surprise there, right? It's a function of these three variables, the fourth, fifth, and sixth inputs to the Lagrangian. They occur here. There's no dependence here in the kinetic energy on the first, second, and third, or the seventh input. Now, over here, we have this so-called velocity-dependent potential. Okay, fair enough. And remember, this is part of our new world view, where you can write down any Lagrangian you like, if it gives you the right answer upon applying the Euler-Lagrange uh, procedure. And this Lagrangian does produce this equation of motion. Again, it's a remarkable story. Let's think about what you have to do. First, we'll compute some partial derivatives with respect to x, y, and z. Well, v is a function of x, y, and z, and a is a function of x, y, and z. Then we'll compute some partial derivatives with respect to x dot, y dot, and z dot. So this is the first term kinetic energy is no surprise. It's rather uh, familiar to us now. But here, we do have occurrences of x dot, y dot, and z dot. So you see, as you set up the Euler-Lagrange equations, you get a bunch of terms. You get a bunch of derivatives of these potentials, okay? And then, as you know, there's also a step where you must compute a total time derivative. That means you insert here, r of t, you put it in there. Then you put the r of t in here, and then you compute a total time derivative. So it's a massive exercise in uh, employing the chain rule on a grand scale. And remarkably, all of the derivatives that occur, you have derivatives of V and you have derivatives of A, they occur in precisely this amazing structure so that when you write down the equations of the motion, there is only reference to the electric ma and magnetic fields. Okay? There's no longer any direct reference to the potentials. And this is wonderful because the electric and magnetic fields are what is physically meaningful. Okay, so it's a remarkable story. Um, we won't go through the calculations here. I do have them in the lecture notes, which I publish. As you know, there are two folders, one for the video and one for uh, where I put the PDF files for the lectures. Um, so you can read about it. Our interest right now is in appreciating the structure, all right? And this new world view, right? If you go on in theoretical physics, certainly, you're going to be seeing lots of people uh, write down Lagrangians and just start adding terms and saying, well, let's see what we get here with this term. The basic philosophy is you have a Lagrangian. You uh, write down the Euler-Lagrange equations to get equations of motion, differential equations to be solved. And in this case, it's remarkable that this Lagrangian here, right? How did they get this? They might have considered the most general 
you see this is linear in velocity this term here it's the velocity dotted into a vector field which is a function of x y z and t okay then you grind out the derivatives okay so that brings us to the two o'clock hour i um Actually, my schedule today is rather cramped, so I am going to uh, end the recording. I can take a few quick questions, but otherwise, just shoot me an email. Uh, okay, we have a question. What is a first integral? I mentioned homework three. <clears throat> a first integral, um, this, uh, actually, let me pause the recording here. Um, the first integral is something that we have been using, and, um, uh, 